Welcome to Doc Talk, a weekly podcast featuring Monument Health physicians addressing medical topics. Tune into your health with Monument Health. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another edition of Doc Talk with Monument Health. My name is Mark Houston, and joining me today is Dr. Marin Gall, a dermatologist at Monument Health Dermatology. Dr. Gall, glad to have you here. Thanks for I don't, having me. I don't know why I've been so excited to constantly talk about skin in these podcasts, though. <laughs> Maybe that's just because that's what everybody sees. Everybody sees it. Everybody <laughs> has an issue at some point. Right. Um, how did you get here? Are you not from, you're not from Rapid City or South Dakota, are you? No, I'm not from here, okay. but I went to high school and college in Minnesota. Oh, excellent. Which is where I met Dr. Siri, <laughs> as she goes by. Um, and she's from here. Yes. So she convinced me that this is the place to be. Really? Um, and even more strange, I guess, is that one of my mentors during residency, I asked him, you know, private practice is the way to go. Academics I'm not interested in, but what about all these hospitals and multi-specialty clinics? And he said, well, no. <laughs> and he said, well, wait, I do know one guy that I went to residency with and he's really happy. He works in Spearfish. Really? And so I Googled mm -hmm. him. And then I saw Siri next to him working for not Monument at that sure. point. But okay. yeah, so, so apparently this is the only happy hospital <laughs> to work for, <laughs> for a dermatologist. Uh, that's a great plug right there. Um, <laughs> why, why, did you, why did you choose this discipline, this, this profession? Is... Dermatology is the best in medicine because really? there's so much variety procedurally, um, medically, and pathology. And everyone has a skin issue at some sure. point. And when I was in medical school, I went to see my parents between years in the summer. And my dad said, hey, what's this on the back of my calf? It's a little itchy. I had been, you know, through one year, a little bit of dermatology, uh -huh. a few lectures. And I looked and I said, that's a melanoma. You got to get that off. And in two seconds, you can save a life potentially. And oh. someone you care about, you know, and you don't have to have any special tests to know, which right. is really cool. So that, uh, that that has to be, I guess I never would have thought of dermatology as something that's an exciting profession. You know, when you talk about, well, when you talk about these guys like trauma doctors and things like that, they get in it for that whole, you know, the, the rush of that's it all. That's a different level of stress that I have no interest in. <laughs> but yeah, you get to, and and, and it's not, and it, the nice thing about being a dermatologist, I think, too, is it's not super invasive, really. You can look at somebody, you know, and say, oh, yeah, I see this, I see this, I see this, this might we should check this out. Um, and does that, I mean, does, does that appeal to you? Can, can you see more people as well, uh, kind of in your profession too, uh, kind of in and out faster? Of and course, help because a lot it? of people come in for something normal. Sure. And it's a quick, this is nothing as far as anything that you need to worry about right. and, and go. But um, even though it's kind of simple like that, I think we see some amazing transformations and we really change lives. And People's confidence level on how their skin looks affects so much as oh, they sure. go on from being, you know, teenagers with acne. And you can see them clearer from the worst acne to better than my skin, you know, <laughs> six months later. Right. And we're not that invasive, but we do cut people's faces yeah. and transform how they look for better or for worse. <laughs> um, well, and speaking of, of, of things like acne and, uh, and, and, and the products that you can use for your skin, a lot of people, I'm sure, turn to over-the-counter stuff. That's probably the first place they look when they're looking to, to help their skin or to clear things up. And it can be, it can be really, really challenging to go down some of those aisles to see what's out there. And of course, you have to know that's garbage. This works, right? I mean, there has to be a lot of that. That's, that's Most, Mostly, yes. I think it's really challenging because the marketing mm -hmm. is ridiculous. Right. <laughs> and the options are so varied. And then you have all the ingredients and they might be a good form or a bad form or too strong or not strong enough or not stable in some packaging, et right. cetera. Um, and for me, too, as a f physician recommending some things, I've gone to some stores and not that many lately because <laughs> um, my husband does all the grocery shopping, et cetera. <laughs> but um, I can't believe that I can't even find what I'm asking oh, or, really? or what I'm 
what I'm advising people to go and buy sometimes. Okay. So plus 2020 and all that, the, yep. the shelves have been empty right. at times in Alaska and here where I've been. Um, so that's tough because then they're only left with a few options if they want to go to one store and they might pick something that's not even worth that it. That you wouldn't recommend. Mm-hmm. Well, is there anything, is there uh, kind of generally, because I, I think, you know, since, since we all have skin and we're all worried about it, and they're, they're aside from, you know, exercise and, and eating rights, you know, you'll run into problems with your skin. doesn't matter how healthy you are in some instances. Are there certain products, uh, skincare products that that are that like everybody should use or everybody could use it's kind of universal is there stuff like that that you recommend look you know you're healthy you eat right but you know do this are there things like that in your that you recommend yes of course and going back to your beginning of your question i wouldn't discount the exercise and eating right because actually that probably has the biggest effect on your skin and people don't think about that at all um, but yes, so gentle cleansers and gentle moisturizers, I think everyone can benefit from that. And the brands that I really like are Vanna Cream and CeraVe as two good options. to Just find over the counter kind of? Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, now I've, I've seen in, in turning to social media for your health advice is just the worst, really, uh, influencers especially. Um, yes. It's interesting when I see uh, people mention things, though, like, you know, when you're in the shower, people shower sometimes two, three times a day, right? Um, Is it necessary to constantly soap your skin when you're in the shower? Or does your skin do just a really good job of keeping itself clean except for the, 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 you know, the areas that should be? Well, we often say the dirty areas, the greasy, oily yes. areas should be washed, um, feet and genitals mm-hmm. and armpits. Yeah. Sure. Okay. Um, for older patients, definitely, I would not soap all over because that is stripping your skin of its natural moisture. And they have a tendency to get eczema. So, no, but there are other people where I think they should use a fair sure. amount of soap and they don't. Okay. Um, and that can affect, you know, folliculitis and acne and uh, odors as well. <laughs> right. <laughs> sure. Is there, is there soaps you just totally avoid that you're like, don't ever use yes. these kind of things? Like what, what would be an example of Anytime that? I have someone with eczema that's older, they say they're using Dial, they're using Irish Spring. <laughs> Okay. And so in general, don't go for the fragranced things. Okay. But, but that smells so good. You smell like I you're know, an iron. I smell very boring <laughs> in my whole household. I mean, even down to the laundry detergent. Uh, now, I know another question a lot of people, or you'll, they'll ask or you'll, you'll see uh, in a lot of marketing too, is, is vitamin C, right? Right. Is, you, you see so many different, it's, to me, vitamin C is almost like the, the egg question. Sometimes it's good for you. Sometimes it's not. I, I don't. It depends on what you're reading. Mm-hmm. For your skin, though, is it important? Is vitamin C something that you should be looking for in in your skincare routine? I definitely would add that on. Really, if you okay. want to have some ingredients that are trying to help you with aging and damage. Really? Yes. Now, uh, like, what other types of um, um, chemicals or products would you look for and stuff? I don't want to use the well, word chemicals. That makes it sound harsh. But First of all, vitamin C is a lot more complex than most people think. Okay. Because it is very unstable with light. Oh. So you have to have something that is in a container that keeps the light out. And you have to think about when you open it up to use it, how much light is getting in as well. I so see. some companies don't do a very good job with okay. that. Okay. And then the percentage also makes a difference. And the higher the percentage, the more irritating it can be at first when you're using things and you're not used to it. So a 10% is a sweet spot probably. Higher would be more difficult for sensitive skin to use. Um, And then there are different forms of vitamin C and some are worthless (laughs) and some are great. (laughs) Okay. And there are some products that have added other ingredients to help stabilize vitamin C. So the classic ones are vitamin E and ferulic. And those are found in SkinCeuticals, um, vitamin C with E and ferulic. 
And that is a more expensive brand, of right. course, but that's where more, more of the studies were done. So a lot so of people, the gold standard. They, they, they use this for, for aging, you said? That's the, I mean, is, is that kind of the main use for vitamin C in these kind of skin products or, or are there other benefits from it? So aging, yes, it helps to decrease fine lines and wrinkles. It boosts collagen production because it's a cofactor for the enzymes that allow you to cross-link and build new collagen. Um, but it also is helping with free radicals um, because it's an antioxidant. Mm -hmm. And free radicals are created when you have UV damage and potentially other damage to the skin like pollution and smoking and all of that. So that helps you avoid precancerous cells and potentially cancers in the future as no it kidding. progresses. Yes. Oh, that is super interesting. And also latest research shows that if you have vitamin C and vitamin E together, it can act like a sunscreen. So in addition to sunscreen, this can be helpful. Well, and we get into these winter months too around our area and a lot of people speaking of sunscreen, they figure, well, now that it's cold out, I don't need to use sunscreen anymore. I used it for, you know, May through September. Why now? But I think you still recommend that, correct? Even in the wintertime? We definitely do. Yeah. Um, you're going to get UV damage from sunlight no matter when, although it's not as strong in the winter, um, depending on where you are with geography. Right. Um, but you also get damage from visible light and screens. So... You have to think really? about that. No kidding. When you're sitting in front of a computer or under these awful fluorescent lights, mm -hmm. that, that, that can still happen. Yes. Oh, man. We just need to do everything in the dark. <laughs> just have everything completely off. Well, it's funny you say that because when I do skin checks on older people, generations that did not take off their shirts, mm -hmm. they have such younger looking skin as far as what we see with sun damage and it's white and it's smooth and, <laughs> and then you look at their faces it's completely different right oh now i can't even take my shirt off in the summertime anymore <laughs> I, I, definitely not trust me i wasn't doing that anyway um <laughs> uh that's uh the the other the other two uh big words that i think you see sometime too when it comes to skin care when you're walking down some of those aisles or, or or even you know when you go see somebody like you um, the words retinol and retinoid, are there, well, first off, what are they? And is there a difference between the two? Sure. So retinoids are vitamin A derivatives that are medications. And there are oral medications and topicals. And retinols are a type of retinoid that is topical and over the counter. And they are probably 10 to 20 times less strong than a prescription retinoid topical. Okay. And they have to undergo different changes um, with enzymes to become active. And there are multiple steps along that way. So retinoid, is, is, that more a is that more of a prescription then? So they're all retinoids. Okay. But a retinoic acid is a prescription form of an topical retinoid. And what would they generally be used for? So we prescribe these for things like acne and psoriasis oh, and sure. other um, disorders of keratinization. Mm -hmm. um, however, often we like to prescribe them for anti-aging and also uh, anti-sun damage, really. I mean, if people have a history of precancerous lesions, there are different topicals you can use to help with that if your insurance will cover it or sure. you're willing. But uh, a, a retinoic acid like tretinoin has been shown to do a decent amount of change to make it worthwhile. So you can, is it possible to reverse the effects of sun damage? Can you do that in, on most people's skin? Definitely. I am a prime really? example. <laughs> I lifeguarded in high school. Oh my. I found my baby book my mom had written. I was a June baby. Oh, the sun-kissed baby got to go to the beach, like, in the first month of life. Right. And, yeah, so my Whoops. parents were big into outdoors. 
So it can uh, it can be it can be fixed. That's always good to know because you can see some pictures if you look online of people. Um, the the ones that I think are most fascinating are you see truck drivers. Mm-hmm. The left half of their face sun damage. The right is fine. Can you can that be fixed then to kind of reverse all that in some instances? That extreme yeah. photo that I show my patients <laughs> too that would take a lot more than just a few top really in many years. <laughs> but I yes. Suppose. Um, Actually, there have been some studies on sunscreens like ISDIN um, in people with a history of precancers or skin cancers. Mm -hmm. And that alone has been shown to improve and reverse the changes. And if you continue to protect yourself, plus use these fancy sunscreens with special things to improve, um, you will see less new things coming up. So when do you recommend people come to see you? Um, is there is there an age when people should start to see you, like regularly? Um, or do you recommend, look, if you're out in the sun and you're doing things, you know, you should just come in every year to make sure. Do you have recommendations there for people? Yes. It's complex. <laughs> um, family histories of mm-hmm. melanomas or, you know, strong family histories where they were early ages, it's a good idea for someone to come in. We used to say more around 35, have an annual skin check, but I do see random teenagers with melanoma, and it's shocking. Right. And definitely a lot of people in their 20s who did a lot of tanning booth time, and they have skin cancers early. Mm-hmm. So if you have something that's not healing, an ugly duckling that doesn't fit in with the rest. Right. And a month timeline is kind of, if the body isn't taking care of it, that's when to come in. That's more appropriate than telling every single person to go get a skin check. Sure. Because, it, again, insurances don't love that, but the data doesn't really support it. So okay. doing skin checks on a bunch of little kids, not really going to find much most of the time. Unless it's totally mm-hmm. out of the ordinary and you're like, I, right. we know that doesn't look right. But people that in. have multiple moles... 50 or more, they're at a little higher risk of getting a melanoma. Oh, really? mm-hmm. Not from the moles, but right. from a new spot. And those that have dysplastic or atypical nevi syndrome, which are kind of weird fried egg looking uh, moles that aren't completely similar throughout looking at a circle with the same pigmentation, um, those people should probably be checked every six to 12 months. Okay. So family history plays a lot into going in early, really. Right. Okay. Um, well, this uh, this has been a lot of fun talking to you, Dr. Gall. And I have one last question personally for me, because I'm, uh, I'm, I'm not saying I'm addicted to it, but I do use a lot of lip balm. Okay, because it seems like my lips are constantly dry. Mm -hmm. And when we live in places like this, in the summertime, you do it for the sun. In the wintertime, it just gets dry and everything just starts to hurt. Um, Do you, what's the best one to use? I'm so tired of bouncing around these things. Are there ones that are better than others? And what should you avoid in that situation too? Definitely. I'm in the same boat. My daughter is and I am after her every day to use Aquaphor. Aquaphor. Mm -hmm. Why? Because there's nothing in it that you will react to. Okay. That and Vaseline is essentially what that is. And it's the most moisturizing. And Aquaphor tends to hang out a little bit longer than plain Vaseline or Vanapply, which is a Vana Cream's Vaseline-y ointment version really? of it. So I find that that's the best thing. And that's what I use for diaper barriers and, and any wounds as well. It promotes healing and keeping things more moisturized. So the super expensive stuff that has like beeswax in it is just pointless, really. Yes. <laughs> I just love the straight answer on that. It's not like, you know, we're going to kind of beat around the bush and try to find something positive. Just don't use it. Camphor, obviously, is another one that's just not helpful on your lips at all, is it? I wouldn't use that on my lips. Right. Either. Okay. So, well, that is so good to know. I, I don't know why. I mean, I've been going to... Uh, I do see Dr. Siri. She's mm-hmm. the, my dermatologist. And I've never once thought to ask that question. And I leave the office and you feel like an idiot because, you know, right. Here's good advice. If you're going to see somebody like Dr. Gall, write down your questions. OK, don't walk out of there without the information because, you know, people come in and they, you look at a few things. And, and then when you leave, just, you know, don't hesitate. You guys are all great at what you do. You have a wonderful dermatology department there. 
and you know uh, you're saving lives and you're making people feel better and look better you know in a lot of instances so don't ever hesitate to ask the dumb questions that's that's how you get the answers oh i like those dumb easy questions <laughs> that's perfect well dr gall thank you so much for coming in and talking to me i really appreciate this and uh you know as we get uh, maybe deeper into winter time too we'll have some more questions popping up for dry skin and things like that that happen with people as well uh and how they can fix it because it's you know it's that season so thank you very much for talking with me my pleasure